Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of the Red Hat Summit here in the Mile High City, Denver, Colorado. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host, Rob Strecce. We are here in the Colorado Convention Center. The floor is buzzing with energy. Yeah, Mile High Energy, to put it, uh, I, I think what you said earlier, calling it Red Hot. <laughs> red Hot, Red, red Hat, Hat Summit. Red Hat Summit, <laughs> is, and Ansible Fest as yeah. well, is like really key because there's so many fun announcements that really take you from pre, you know, thought on AI all the way to deployment and production that I think really is key to where organizations are at right now. Yeah, and yeah. I, and we, we have somebody pretty important to, to talk through that indeed. as well. We do, indeed. What a great segue to welcome Matt Hicks. He is the CEO of Red Hat. Thank you so much for coming back on theCUBE. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. I'm uh, excited to be here. So as we were just talking about, there have been a, a large number of product announcements and enhancements, but I know that there are two in particular that you believe really bring the Red Hat playbook and ethos yeah. of open communities, um, open contributions, and open ideas to AI. I'd love you to just t walk our viewers a little bit through those. Yeah, if you look, um, the two ingredients I think at the center for us are the opening of language and code models. Because if we look at what's happening in AI, there's a language element of can you summarize better, can you understand documents, go through them. And then there's a coding element that's near and dear to my heart of that I think it will change how we write apps, how we get, build better quality. But then hand in hand with that goes the Instruct Lab technology, which is as good as these models get, they never do my thing or the thing I want. And training them has been, at least for me, impressively hard over the last year. The technology can work and this just uh, puts it within reach of being able to train using a lot of new technologies uh, well. And so teaching these two really capable models new things, I think, is at the core of everything else you'll see at Summit this year. Yeah, I, I think again, the, to me, it was so exciting to see that demo that was done. I, I thought, you, I, by the way, I thought the, the how you progressed through the keynote was fantastic. Awesome. And I, I think again, it was really helping bring the pieces together and really in a, in a way kind of pull that thread through. Yeah. Uh, and I think part of that really was the fact that it, it is about partnerships. Yeah. A yeah. lot of the announcements today are with partners and even some of the ones that happened at Ansible Fest yep. keynote as well are around partnerships. Talk to us about that because yeah. I, you even said it uh, you know, on stage, it kind of felt like the early days of Linux again. Yeah, yeah. No, it, um, I think Red Hat's at its best when we are focused on building blocks. That's what, yeah, I started Red Hat 18 plus years ago and our building block was Linux. It was make this consumable for enterprises, light up hardware, work with the OEMs and put it in the hands of developers and people. When I look at, at this work with RHEL AI, on one side, everything's different. It's not CPU based, it's GPU based. Um, the machines are a bit different, but it is the exact same playbook of how do you take all this excitement and innovation, make it consumable to enterprises, and then work with both the technology providers like NVIDIA, Intel, AMD, and the OEMs who are going to put together like a Dell PowerEdge that users can then start to work with. And I love every second of it because it just feels um, back to our sweet spot, the thing we, we do, and it really has reach to anyone on the planet that's starting with AI because of those partnerships. Yeah, and, and I think a lot of that also talks to the simplicity that yeah, people are definitely. looking for, because there's always the top of the pyramid accounts that are going to have the people, the, yeah. the staffing that they can throw at it, but I, I, I would suspect that in the back of your mind, it's like, how do we get to that big middle, that fat middle of people who might not have that skill set and have those? Is that a really also part of the strategy of how you glue those two layers together? A hundred percent. I would say it's on two areas of both end users with it, where I love the, I talked about, you know, this doesn't solve all problems, but there are a lot of problems you can put in this knowledge bucket and skills bucket. So I think it'll be really applicable for end users um, and it makes it simpler. But then if you look like our ISV ecosystem or the system integrators, it also like they're going to have more reach to customers than we will. 
and they can build their next thing, embedding AI into it in also a more simple fashion. So I, I love both elements of that. Of There will be a lot of solutions built that use this inside that customers don't ever need to see. It just makes more powerful solutions. And then I enjoy every minute of working with customers when you see that light bulb, they're like, this is what I would do with knowledge and this would be my skill. Because um, it's reinforcing of this is a pattern people have struggled with, it has that value. So I think we'll see both there. Well, when I hear you talking about how the models are so impressively hard and exceedingly yeah. difficult to train, I mean, I, I would have no hope. Yeah. And so the idea that you are democratizing yeah. the, the training of these models, can you talk about the ways in which you envisage companies actually putting them and, and making them come to life and what, yeah. they, what they'll do? I think there's, there's two elements of that. One, in my experience, I've used a lot of these models and as, as impressive as they are, they all have gaps. Figuring out how to plug a gap is almost impossible on it. So one side on this is we want to make it really simple to if you use Granite or the code models and say, this has a gap of knowledge that I know, we can make it as easy as contributing to Wikipedia to say, I will, I will give you my knowledge and skill, you make the model better for everyone. So there's a widening of open source contributors. Um, then the other side I would say is, if you go back a year, you needed to spend a lot of money to even try this operation. At this point, one of the things I'm most passionate about is we can make the training work in like single phases on a laptop. So if it is your IP, and you're not ready to spend a half a million dollars on a machine, uh, you can at least start to do what I did in the early days at Linux, like just my laptop or my desktop, see if directionally um, my skill, my knowledge sticks with this. And then if it does, you can progress those bets. That progression, I think, also democratizes what people can do with the hardware they have, um, even if they're not going to contribute it. If it's like, this is my business idea, I want to progress it. Not many people can jump into the uh, really expensive hardware that quickly. So those are the two I love, is others contributing in, and then you being able to work from those and still hold your own IP, if you want. Yeah, I, in speaking about expensive uh, hardware, I mean, you, you <laughs> had, you had you know, Dell from the systems, the OEM perspective on yep. stage, you had Pat Gelsinger on, uh, which yeah, I yeah. thought you pulled off, which I know how hard those are, <laughs> and being able to talk to somebody who's not actually in the room and have that conversation was fantastic. And then uh, Stephanie had NVIDIA on yeah, later yeah. on. Uh, I, I, we're going to have all of them on later in the day and tomorrow, yep, yeah. so I am excited about that. But help, help us you know, understand, it. what is it like to work with them around these ideas? Because I mean, even Dell got into, hey, we used Instruct Lab and things of that nature, and yeah. you know, Pat was talking about some of that as well. And yeah. It, you know, if you look at, it's like a renaissance right now of hardware innovation. So you have NVIDIA, Intel, AMD, and as Josh mentioned, you'll have others building ridiculous capabilities in GPUs. But then you need OEMs to like, you know, in the case of Dell, I'm going to put eight of them together in a PowerEdge box for you. Those boxes are really powerful. And so all of a sudden now, like a single power edge, you can actually train your own models and run a lot of inference. And so you have both the interest in the GPU creator saying, I need use cases that will use these and use them to their greatest extent. And then you have the Lenovo's and Dell's and Cisco's of the world that will pull this together in an appliance that can put AI in a box. And Getting AI in a box, like this is not going to be a, a reality a year from now, it'll be a reality like a month from now, which those are exciting, because it, it just makes something work that was a concept a year ago uh, for a lot of the world. Well, and, and I, th I think again, when you start to look at image mode and things of that nature yeah. with RHEL, and it, it seemed like, it, it reminded, to your point about going backwards, it reminded me of the craze of virtual appliances. Yeah, yep. And how do we simplify the deployment of AI? Yep. Is that what you guys are seeing that, yeah. I mean, to me that makes total sense. A hundred, if you look at the, the layers that go below running a model, 
it's astounding how much complexity is in there. And so the simplicity that I grew up with within Unix and Linux of building blocks and I can weave them together, it's still there. It's just a thousand times bigger. And so having that appliance, like I can, this machine only exists to run and train LLMs. Uh, let me just get the appliance working. I actually think it's a round of appliance technology that it won't be craziness this time around. It'll be in that space of more utility than craziness there. So. Well, speaking of your ecosystem of partners, and you, you, you were mentioning the big tech players, but on the main stage you were also talking about academia yeah, and, yeah. And, the, and the AI alliance yep. and, and bringing in uh, research institutions that are, that are taking breakthroughs and turning them into models within a week. Yeah. How closely are you working with researchers and, and what do you see as the promise of working together with academics and, and researchers at colleges and universities? It has been a a total sea change from the world that I grew up in, which was, you know software engineering, you can build anything on it. On the third floor in our building, we have a group from MIT that works with us every single day. The knowledge and depth you need to make training work better, it is almost like the PhD academia work. You'll do your doctorate on that, but there's such, such a strong link to Academia will contribute what they've done in papers and contribution. It's the first time I've ever seen it actually, where they are the driving force behind AI. The mathematics, it is so deep. Uh, they're the creators. We are the channel for that, to put it in the hands, of, make it work on laptops, link it up to GPUs. But it's such a symbiotic relationship there. It's, um, you know, we say like how much you work, it, it really is. It is every day, they're a core part of the team. Um, and then we'll expand that to universities around the world, but it's a new community for us. It's not just kernel contributors now, it is. And an untapped one it sounds like too. It really is. It's, uh, so I love those of just seeing open source expand and then being able to put it in the hands of people that can use it and build new ideas, is, uh, it's really exciting. So I, I think that is a great segue back into kind of the first announcement around Granite and, and really the open sourcing of Granite for both the LLM side and the code assistance side. Yeah. Help people understand why that is such a big deal. Yeah, if, um, if you look at what it takes to build what we'll call a base model for this, so um, specifically we'll call it the pre-training phase, which is like download the internet and learn from it and and produce this thing. Uh, it costs in the tens or hundreds of millions of dollars to produce that file, basically. Uh, so it's a very tough thing to say, there's not going to be a lot of companies doing this. It's going to be a few companies doing that. So we wanted to figure out, like, where can we build an open source community around that when it's a little disingenuous to say, like, you should try this as well. I'm like, if it's 100 million, I won't be trying it anytime <laughs> soon. Uh, but this is why we picked Apache as the license, yeah. because it creates freedom and usage to say, we have put the $100 million plus into this. You can use it how you see fit. You can build derivative works. It can be open source. It can be proprietary. The second side of this that we're really passionate about is openness in the data, because we talk about things like copyright infringement, uh, those models are trained on the internet and in the world. And like creators put their own content out there and took the time to, it is copyrighted. In code, they have licenses on it. Like we live in open source. We're very passionate about saying as a user of the model, you should be able to adhere to what those creators wanted. Those are the two areas. I doubt we have it perfect coming out of the gate. But why this has been really fundamental to us is try to, um, really chart that course and how we can make the data open and protect creators and protect users and then make it permissive enough in usage license wise to let you chase whatever idea you want with it. What, what I also, I, I think it was an understated comment was the indemnification as yeah, well. Because yeah. you start to look at organizations and they're afraid if, hey, is this on you know, proprietary data, been trained on proprietary data where somebody like the New York Times is going to come after me yeah. once I go and launch it or something like yeah. that. Yeah, or you think of um, code in the case. Oh yeah. I love people say, uh, don't worry, it was trained on permissive licenses. 
Permissive licenses still require you to attribute yes. the, the original author. Um, and licenses like GPL, like they don't have to be scary if you're comfortable with the license redistribution rights. We live with 40, 50 different open source licenses tied to copyright in our world. So it is a sweet spot for us to like, this isn't an area to be afraid of. You just have to understand the origins to make sure you're treating the outputs properly. So it'll evolve a lot over the next year, but that is, you know, if I look at the last 30 years of Red Hat's existence in open source, I feel like this is a phenomenal link for us to be able to add in making this stuff safe to use as well. Yeah, I mean, it, this, this really is a recurring theme that this is this moment in time is Red Hat's sweet spot in yeah, terms yeah. of the way the, the Red Hat way, yep. uh, the way you approach open source and 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 in technology in general. Uh, during your keynote, I felt like you were being you were in a bit of a reflective and contemplative mood. You talked a little bit about joining Red Hat 18 years ago yeah, as a Linux yeah. admin and and working your way up to to managing and leading teams, and now here you are, I've been CEO for about two years. Talk a little bit about, about your journey and, ab and about what this moment in time, this, this, a this AI era that we are now living in, and, and the excitement that you're seeing, yeah. and, 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 and how it has reminded you maybe of, of when you got your start. It, it is, there's a, behind us 500 feet is the Instruct Lab group, and it's a young group of engineers that I see myself in every day, because for me with Linux, the moment that, and I was a consultant, I was doing Unix deployments and sysadmin all day, I would work twice as hard to make Linux systems work because I could understand every piece of them. I could change them. I learned a lot, this is in like the early 2000s, I learned a lot of programming itself from seeing how the kernel was built. And so that like, Feeling like um, I can use this to show my own potential was really powerful. I'd say like it's the undercurrent for my whole career. And I get to watch these early career associates see the same thing in AI. And so this is why I'm, cool. I'm not a fan of like AI is just something you use, it's behind an API call. I like the word like demystify it. This is something you can put your fingerprints on, you can show the world what you can do. So that's that link of like when I see Instruct Lab and training and open source models, it's today's generation's equivalent of what I grew up with in Linux. And it's, um, I love it, I love every minute of it. So. How, do you, how do you see an AI changing Red Hat's ability to go faster? Right, it just, I'm curious, because you guys always use your own software, you know, as somebody would say, drink your own champagne before, yeah. you know, everybody else. How have you seen it change kind of inside Red Hat? I'll give you one example. So we, we really took the decision to, as we were seeing this technology go from like, its inception to working, to working really well, to like, I can't believe this works on a laptop. It was about a month ago that we said, we will reframe everything that we're doing at Summit around this. And it was the fastest I have seen Red Hat move in 18 years. Instruct Lab didn't exist as a thing. There was no logo, there was no booth. There was, um, there was a quickly progressing technology that we felt like had the impact to change the world. Uh, my teams know, it's like we go back after this and the pace doesn't slow down on it because it is just such an amplifier to the core skills and what we do. It's, um, I see it as very additive to teach us speed and then have us bring in the assurance and safety that we're known for on it. So it's, it's been fun. It changes every element of how we do support, um, how we do internal training, what we put on engineers' laptops, how we do sales, uh, it'll touch every aspect of the company. So we know that the pace of change is staggering and it's only accelerating and talking a little bit about that momentum and how it has allowed you and empowered you to move so much faster. Yeah. Where will we be one year from now at the next Red Hat Summit? <laughs> what are we going to be talking about? What are, what are the, the underlying Ooh. themes? Hopefully adoption. I think that's where you always start. <laughs> okay. Like new idea you want to be talking about. Like the, um, Dr. Grant and Rudolph, when they were talking about uh, the work at Boston Children's Hospital, 
I think nothing drives us more than seeing clinicians using your technology in radiology. Like it's, um, so I think next year I would hope to see lots and lots of the adoption. But I would say right now as an industry, I feel like the whole world is in, when we talk about dev to prod, they're all in dev right now because it is changing so fast, you don't have a stable foundation. My hope is to move a chunk of that to production with it because we can give them that, it's not going to be 10 years like RHEL, but if it's a year of stability, it gives you just enough to get your value out of your investment while you do the next thing. So that, that's my hope for next year is like shift the industry a little more to production and just hear some of these incredible stories, what people do with your technology is. That's, uh, that's where we live. Production and adoption. Matt Hicks, thank you so much for coming on the show again. We always enjoy having you. Thank you very much. I'm Rebecca Knight for Rob Stretch. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of the Red Hat Summit. You are watching theCUBE, the leader in technology enterprise coverage. <laughs>